Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. What does food mean to you? Tell me in a recorded soundbite of no longer than 60 seconds. Email it to me at maria at marialiberati.com. And if your soundbite is selected to be part of an upcoming segment, I will send an autographed copy of my book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, to you. I just love having my listeners be part of the show, so please join in. This show is being released during the month of April, which just happens to be the month of Earth Day, Fresh Tomato Day, National Fresh Garlic Month, National Fresh Celery Month, National Day of Fresh Mushrooms, and National Zucchini Bread Day. Anyone that knows me knows how much I love my fresh veggies and fruit. It all started from being a Philly Italian market baby. I mean, I grew up going shopping for fresh fruits and veggies with my grandparents in Philly's Italian market. There, the vendors would give you a taste of things before you purchase them. I just love tasting all the fresh produce and being there was an experience, more than just a taste. As Italians from Abruzzo, my family was brought up with a tradition of always having fresh salad after the main course and fresh fruits after dinner. You know, it's such a tradition in our house that even my dog loves them for dinner. And so I just can't live without my fresh fruits or salad. And now that we are all staying home to stay healthy and safe, we can take some time to plant our own herbs or produce. No matter how small your space is, there are so many ways to grow fresh veggies and fruits. And if you have never experienced a freshly grown vegetable that goes from backyard to table, you should try it. There is nothing that is fresher. Someone once said that gardening is the slowest of the performing arts, and it is truly an art. Today, my special guests are Frank Ferragine, also known as Frankie Flowers, a gardening expert who's really a gardening guru from City TV in Toronto, Canada, to give us gardening tips, and Tony Bracco from Bracco Farms, where they grow fresh produce sustainably and organically at their farm in this little town with amazing soil and an amazing history in Pine Island, New York. Hi, I'm really excited today to be here with Frankie Flowers who is from City TV in Toronto, and he is a a highly sought-after gardening and flower expert, and he's going to tell us some great tips about growing your own flowers and uh, how to pump up your home gardens. So I guess I'll just let Frankie tell us a little bit about himself, and I love that name, Frankie Flowers. So Frankie, welcome, and thank you for being here and uh, sharing your expertise with us. Yeah, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here, too, because you know what? There's food, there's flowers, there's friends, there's family, and that's really what you want. Uh, yeah, indeed. My name is Frank Bergini, a.k.a. Frankie Flowers. I'm a four-time best-selling author. Uh, my family have greenhouses uh, just north of Toronto in a community called Bradford, Ontario. We are previous farmers, but I also have some cousins that farm in an area called the Hall of Marsh that farm everything from Radicchio to Colorado to uh, chicory, to a whole bunch of different things. Um, Gardening, uh, flowers is in my blood. If you were to drive around my community, you would actually see L&D Farragina, one of my cousins, the Nazos, another cousin, that's actually another grower, and then you'll see the Rigas, that's another cousin, that's another grower. So all we do is we grow, and with that, uh, we really love, we're passionate about what we do. Wow, that's great. So it's actually in your blood, as I can say, it's definitely in your blood, the gardening and the flowers and all that. It's all over um, with your family. That's wonderful. So what what first drew you into gardening? I guess it's probably, I mean, you've probably answered that already because it was already everybody in your family's doing it. Well, I would say, you know, at first I said it's child labor. That was yeah. <laughs> Uh, but originally, my grandfather, my nunno, wanted me to be a lawyer. So I actually went off to university and was accepted law school. And when I was accepted law school, I was like, you know what? I really don't enjoy the paperwork. I really love flowers. I really love gardening. And I really love being outside. And I love motivating people to get out there and garden because I think there's a whole lot of benefit. So that's when I actually pivoted and went into the family business at that time. And then all of a sudden I started doing gardening tips for a small local station 
And then things just grew from there. And now currently on breakfast television, not only do I give garden tips, but also I give the weather. And I've been there for 15 years doing the weather in Toronto. And uh, it's always great because weather, farming, food and gardening all kind of tie together. They do. They are all attached. So that's that's wonderful. So this week's episode is largely about gardens and creating sustainable food sources in communities and backyards. So I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on what I can tell the listeners about um, helping to support our local growers during this crisis that everybody around the world is having. What what would you suggest? First thing is just to reach out to a local grower. So sometimes you can just do a quick Google search and find out who's growing in your area. And then what you can do is with a quick phone call, you can actually find out who they're supplying, where they're supplying, or how they're supplying. Some growers right now have gone to box systems, meaning that what they're doing in terms not only in flour but even in vegetable where they're actually retailing now to you as a consumer. And there's some different options. I know that there are some websites now that they're creating that will do door-to-door delivery. There's curbside pickup. The effort just is a little bit far greater now. Instead of just going to your local grocery store or garden center to buy plants or to buy food, now what you have to do is to reach out and see what options are happening. And in this digital world and in this world where we all adapt, there are options where you can support your local grower. But the first thing is, is, and we used to say this at Farmer's Market, reach out and kind of find out who your grower is, whether it's flowers or food, that's the way to do it. Yes, and I, I think that people really don't reach out or find, you know, their local growers. They're, they just don't know that they are out there. You know, it's not just these big box stores. So people really do need to reach out and do. It's so easy now, too. You can find them on a lot of them on the Internet. So people do need to search them out. But thank you for that. So I think um, what everybody's probably listening for. So if they want to pump up their home gardening game on a budget, what what would that be? What what tips would you have? So first thing I always say to people is the whole goal of gardening is to pick the right plant for the right place. So if we're picking the right plant for the right place, we're going to be successful. We're not going to waste money. And that doesn't matter if it's indoors or outdoors. And the way to pick that right plant for the right place is number one, to determine how much sunlight you're receiving in a space, how many hours you're receiving of sunlight, the soil type. And then if you want it to be a perennial, that comes back each and every year, you're also looking for hardiness zone. So that's going to allow you to curate your selections. If you're growing food, if you want to have a successful food growing garden, my biggest tip is you need six hours of direct afternoon sun to be successful. And I would say a raised bed is always the best way. A raised bed will soil temperatures will warm faster. You'll have less weeds. They're easier to work with and you don't have to bend down as far. Oh, that's great. A lot of great tips there. So with that in mind, tell us more about your garden coaching service. What's that like for those of us in, in, say, in the States or anywhere around the world who may not be able to schedule one? But I guess they really could do that through the Internet. Yeah. You know, I've I've done virtual and that's what I'm doing right now. Yes. Is uh, virtual garden coaching. And just let you know, I've uh, worked right across the country of Canada and I've actually done some projects uh, in the U.S., I even uh-huh. did some interior design work for uh, restoration uh-huh. hardware here in Toronto and also helped with one of the locations um, in West Palm Beach. So I'm familiar with We're all friends. Uh, but essentially what it is, is uh, if you want to grow your own food, if you have a planting plan, if you just need some help, we'll just schedule a call. We can either go virtually or you send me pictures. Uh, we'll spend an hour. I'll walk through things with you. Uh, and then at the end of it, Hopefully, we'll build your confidence, and then we can do check-ins. We can actually even schedule check-ins that during the growing season, uh-huh. if you're having a dilemma and problem, I'll help you out on that end, too. Wow, that's great. And that is really important because I, I notice a lot of people don't have a lot of confidence. So, you know, they think something should be going going a certain way or growing a certain way. So I think that's a great idea to have those check-ins to just give yeah. them that, that support, right? Yeah, so do you- I compare gardening to cooking. So when you started out cooking, you start slow, right? Like, yes. how did you start with cooking? Where did you start? What yeah. do you mean by that? Like, in my mind or the actual place that I started? The first thing you cooked. The first thing I you cooked. remember. Wow, that's really... I probably cooked when I was really young, like a boiled egg. I just imagine that could have probably been something I cooked when I was like eight or ten years old. But you then know? you cooked more, right? Then so I, like with gardening, is kind of like that, right? Exactly. Like, Exactly. Yes, you get more and more confidence. And I think that's what happened to me, too, because I was doing that actually when I was living in Italy. I learned to grow more and more. And then I started. And you're absolutely right. I did that very thing. I just started by growing my own herbs and then I went to growing all these other things. So you're you're absolutely right. So do you speaking of food and vegetables and herbs, do you grow any of your own uh, herbs or 
you know, foods, fruits, vegetables that you use in, in your kitchen? Absolutely. So uh, right now, um, our garden season here in Toronto is we're a, we're a few weeks away before we're going to be really plugging along in the outdoor garden. But right now in my kitchen, I have a small little thing called the click and grow where I have had fresh basil there. Uh-huh. all winter long. So fresh herbs to me is, is key. I always say, if you want to look like you're a good cook and you're not a good cook, just use fresh herbs and people think you're cool. <laughs> yes. Um, they're like, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. Yes. Um, and then during the growing season, I'm always have tomatoes. Last year I did um, some really, I did Trinidadian scorpion peppers. Ooh, uh, that sounds which, interesting. Yeah. They're 2 million Scovilles, meaning that mm-hmm. they are one of the hottest peppers out there. I grew them for fun. And uh-huh. then I, gave them away to people. And I said, when I would hand them to people, I'd say, I'm not responsible. (laughs) (laughs) Beware, beware. Yes. Yes. Wow. Can I ask you, so how do you grow basil all throughout the year? I've had such a problem growing basil. So the click and grow and there's other systems, there's arrow garden and I don't get paid by these guys. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I just want to let you know that uh, full disclosure, I test these little systems and I'm really, it's an aquaponic system inside your home. And what that means oh, is we're yes. growing yeah. in water that has its own lighting system. Yes. So that in the winter months, the thing that we have the biggest challenge is we don't have enough light units, enough daylight yes, out. Yes. But with this light unit, it's fantastic. And the key with basil and any herb is as they're growing, we got to constantly pinch them back. We're almost constantly got to harvest right, new growth. If you don't do that, then they're going to get older, weaker, because we always need that new flush of growth. That's oh, gonna, yes. I, so you always got to give them haircuts, I call it. Yes. Well, that's a great that's a great tip. Yes, I've seen those aquaponic different things, and I've ne- I've actually never tried those. I'm, I'm doing the old school way, but I will definitely, definitely try that because basil is one of my favorite herbs, and I, I love to use it, love to use it in the kitchen. So that sounds like that's one of your favorite herbs to use in the kitchen also. It, it really is. You know, it's the, if you look at the, the history of the name basil, uh, the name itself actually means king. And yes. so it's the king. Yes. Of, uh, and to me, uh, like it is something that I really love. And my son, my son, who's 13 years of age, uh, Gavin, he just goes and grabs pieces of it and just will eat. And um, he's already has a pretty good palate so far in terms of, of what he does. And he, he's cooking already. So he loves cooking with it as well. Oh, that's great. So my last question to you, and I ask this to all my guests, is if you can share with us, what does food mean to you? Connection. Um Oh, so I, yeah, I think food connects everybody. It's, um, you know, some of my most memorable moments in my life where I just had this feeling of, of love, uh, is surrounding about food. And if I, if I really like somebody and it's a friend and I want to get to know them better, I usually say, let's go for lunch. Uh, you know, over food, you know, I've had great conversations and food is what even connected me to marry uh, a woman. So, um, it's amazing. And I'm an Italian as well. So I'm, I'm, I always say I'm only half Italian. My mom's name's Alice. She's not. Um, but food is everything. You know, my family would fight with each other because they're in business together. And then they'd look at each other and they go, Hey, what's to eat? And then all the fights would be done. Yes. Oh, I love it. That's great. Yes. That's the way we Italians are. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Frankie, thank you so much. But lastly, can you tell people, I know you talked about Breakfast TV in Toronto. Where else can people find you if people can't, you know, don't have access to finding you on TV in Toronto, like people anywhere in the world? Do you have a website? Can you give us the URL? Yeah, it's frankieflowers.com. So frankieflowers.com. Super easy. You can find me there. And there's connections to uh, Twitter, Instagram. I do weekly Facebook Lives as well, uh, answering gardening questions. Uh, and yeah, I'm here for you. Like, let's, let's, uh, let me help you take you through the garden path. Definitely. Thank you. And thank you so much. Really fascinating. Thank you. And I'm sure we will be talking to you again with some more gardening tips and, uh, stay safe, stay, stay well. And, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, we will be talking to you soon. Thank you. And bon appetit. Hey, Tony, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good. How Great. Are you? Yes, I wanted you to uh, tell my listeners a little bit about your farm and about Pine Island. I know there's some great stories there, and I always love to tell a story. So, yes, can you tell us a little bit about, about Baraco Farms? 
Okay, well, Bronco Farms, we've owned the farm now. Actually, this is our 10th year, and it'll be our 11th season farming. Uh, it's 25 acres in a small town in Orange County, New York, which is above the border of uh, New Jersey. We can actually see the Delaware Water Gap and the High Point uh, Monument, um, which the High Point Monument is the highest point in New Jersey. We can see that from our farm. It's in a small town of Pine Island, which is a part of the larger town of Warwick, New York. The whole area, the whole region of uh, is, is known as the Black Dirt Region. It's 18 to 20,000 acres of what they call black muck soil. Uh, it's very interesting soil. It's a remnant of the Ice Age when the icebergs when the ice broke up from the last ice age, it left a lot of lakes and a lot of uh, swamps and bogs. And about 120 years ago, farmers came over, immigrants came over from Italy, from Germany, and primarily from Poland. And when they saw the richness of the soil, they drained the marshes and they started to farm it. And wow. they came up with soil that is up to 70% nutrients. Uh, just to give you an example, in Iowa, where you have some of the best soil in the United States for growing corn and soybeans, that's at best 30 percent nutrients. Wow. This is up to 70 percent nutrients, and it's it's illegal to remove it from the county. The I was just I was just out. going to yes, I was just going to ask you. Well, I'm going to be coming over there because I've been having a problem growing some of the things I've been trying to grow, and I'm looking for some great soil. But yes, I guess we unfortunately we can't come over there and uh, get some, steal some from you. <laughs> but that's that's great. So how? Actually, I don't mean to interrupt you, but so okay. basically about how big of the of an area is Pine Island? Like well, how Pine big? Island's very small. Maybe we have about the town itself has uh, maybe about a thousand residents. Um, yeah. Has one school, which unfortunately, because of lack of children anymore in the area, people move away. The farms consolidate. Uh, the school is closed, and now they use it for they run things. The school is a, is a, is a uh, a time capsule of a school built in the 1920s. It's beautiful. Um, so it's a very, very, um, everybody, uh, when I do, I do a lot of talks at libraries and garden clubs, and I always explain the town this way. Everybody who lives there, if you're not in uh, a policeman or a fireman or some sort of civil servant, you're involved in farming and farming support. Either you're a a farmer or you have somebody who fixes the tractors or somebody who who, uh, who, who fixes uh, the farm equipment or supplies farm equipment. Uh, everybody in that area, it's like a, its own little ecosystem, its own little little business hub, and everybody's involved in farming, which you don't really see in society today. And no. It, but the thing is that it's only 45 minutes from downtown Manhattan. So. Oh, my good. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. And as I mentioned to you, as we were chatting before, you know, we have we have a few of these. I mean, I've never heard of a place like this. Maybe there is some somewhere else in the U.S., but people don't appreciate or realize, you know, they think all of these things are just in Europe. But we do have some little very interesting spots that are really not mm -hmm. well known that it really pays to to pay attention. And, you know, these are places in our backyard. Like you said, it's 45 minutes from Manhattan. Who would have thought, you know, these are really interesting places to spend your time and go to, you know, visit or, or take notice of or, or appreciate. So now can people come to the farm or is it just for, you know, um, can people come? I think they can come in and purchase oh, fruits yes. and vegetables. They can purchase. We have a farm stand. Uh, we, we approach it. Uh, we have like a three prong approach with the farm. Um, uh -huh. We do the off season and even sometimes during the season, People, I'm engaged by a lot of libraries and garden clubs and, and, and corporate lunch and learns. A lot of people are interested, especially now, in starting yes. their own yes. garden. So a lot of the thing when you own a small farm, you don't use a lot of mega equipment like the large farms, you pick combines, things like that. We have a tractor, yes. We have a set of discs for tilling the soil. We have a plow. We have certain things, but they're on a smaller scale. But there's yes. a lot of tools because of the size of the farm, we use a lot of hand tools. And a lot of these tools that we use at the farm can be easily adapted to be used in a backyard garden, but yet they're not as readily available like you wouldn't find them at a local garden center or, or Home Depot type store. You'd have to get them from a supplier, but they're no more expensive than you, you would find at those stores. And they make the job a lot more fun and a lot easier. So that's yes. what I do oh. in my talks. 
Oh, wow. And then the, sec- then the second thing we do is we supply a lot of farm-to-table at restaurants, uh, golf resorts, and um, other type of resorts with our vegetables for their, a lot of them have um, restaurants, organic, and they, that's where we come in. We supply a lot of naturally grown produce. And and the third thing is our stand. We open the stand in the summer and we sell directly for, direct to the, to the public that come in. You know? Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah but- so I, I wanted to know because I think that, you know, everybody wants to go to these faraway places, but hey, they have a place mm-hmm. like this in their backyard to come and get fresh fruits and vegetables that are really, really hard to, hard to find. So it's definitely worth a trip. And when this crisis is over, you can be sure I will be one of your visitors because I, I wish, you know, I, I wish really I could get out there now. But hey, when the crisis is over, as I said, I will definitely be stopping by to get a sample of, of mm-hmm. everything there. So that's going to lead me to what, um, what started you in, in this industry? And getting into farming, um, you know, it's a, it, what happened was, uh, you know, I come from an Italian. My family is Italian, and my mother, I'm a first generation American. My father and his whole side of the family came over after the war, and uh, my mother's side of the family that she's I'm second generation from that side of the family. But in, in Europe, uh, particularly my father's side of the family, they were um, my grandmother. They, they had a large farm. And we're from the area near Trieste, northern Italy. Yes. The area there, where Dalmatia. And after the war, unfortunately, everything was lost. But they had, they had a very big operation where they had olives, and they did a lot with wool and then and growing of grains and things of that type. So when they came here, I was uh-huh. always exposed to gardening as a child. We always had oh, big gardens. Yes. So did my grandparents did my grandparents on my mother's side. So it was, but and I always, for some reason, I don't know why, but I always loved it. I, even as a teenager, I had a garden or I worked parents' garden. And my father, he knew how to graft vines and trees. And so yes. I learned nothing from him. Yes. And uh, and at some point, you know, I, I went and I didn't go into agriculture. It's my I say I describe it this way. I'm a graphic designer by trade, by uh-huh. vocation, farmer wow. by action. Ah, so, uh-huh. uh, the farm. You know, I was always looking for um, and my wife will bail me out on this one since we were there. I always <laughs> had this thing. Where I wanted to get a farm. Uh-huh. And uh, so I, I took me years and years just to find the right. Of course, you know, price was a consideration. You have to work with budgets and everything so about 10 years ago we just stumbled on this little place um, you know uh and we said you know the price is right it's close to home I, I kind of drew a circle saying anything beyond 50 miles would be too far to travel you know so right yes looked at it that it's 45 miles from home um and uh so we go there during the week primarily in the summer and the spring and we to do our planting maintaining and and others, and when I'm not at the farm, I'm doing my graphic design projects. So that's one. that's great. And you know, I know it's interesting that you said you're a graphic designer because, uh, and and you do the gardening and farming because the famous painter Claude Monet had said that my garden is my most beautiful masterpiece. So mm-hmm. you know, art and and gardening and farming are very related. I mean, it's beautiful. Absolutely. So Absolutely. so it's definitely definitely <laughs> there's a relation there. Um, so can you also share, I know I saw some things on your website about eco-conscious farming. Can you share right. with my listeners, like ex- give them a little bit of an idea of what eco-conscious farming is? Well, what we do is we, we, tr- we try, even though we're not certified or organic, we, so we follow all the practices of the USDA and uh, the European Union by not using any commercial or, or synthetic pesticides or herbicides or fungicides. If we have to use anything, it's only natural, um, non-poisonous um, to human beings or to animals. Um, so we try to do everything by crop rotation. People don't realize that crop rotation is probably the best thing you can do, whether it's in your garden, transferring things from one box to another box over the seasons, uh, or or use or planting different things in a big field because what that does is the pests get very confused and they don't know if you plant corn then you plant it in another field the next year the corn borer larvae will come up but there's no corn so they will die. And then there'll be no no corn borers in the other field because they weren't there so you're constantly in this juggling act um, and then 
in, in the event that we do have to uh, put some sort of pesticide on, we will use only something that's created naturally. For example, one of the big ones that we may use, which we will use sparingly, is called pyganic. And it's made from pyrethium, which is a byproduct of the root of the marigold plant. Uh -huh. So for some reason, the, the potato beetles and the, the other types of bugs don't like it, and it either kills them or repels them. So we'll maybe use that um, once or twice a season only on one particular thing. I think the thing that gets infested the most is eggplant. For some reason, they love the eggplant leaves. Uh -huh. uh, everything else... If they can't find the eggplant, they'll go to the zucchini. But they don't touch the tomato, they don't touch the peppers, and they don't touch the corn. Which and is really what good. kind of what kind of bug is this again? Or it's called a potato, Colorado potato beetle. Uh, well, you know, I've had problem with I cannot grow broccoli or cauliflower. Do they? Is that? Do they go after? Because I know they just chomp all my leaves and like I'll mm -hmm. go outside and it's just gone. The whole plant it's and it's gone. like it's yes. Gone. Yes. You know, so um, when you have that kind of infestation, then you have to take steps because you'll lose your crop. So yes. I, there, there's a, there's a, 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 a commercial grade of py pyrethium, which you can get a consumer grade. I mean, uh -huh. yes. a local garden center called pyrethium, and that is just a, a more watered down version. And uh, and that'll repel them. The only thing when you use the natural things as opposed to the synthetic is you have to constantly apply it, especially after a rain, because it'll wash away. Because the, the commercial ones and the, um, the synthetic ones use a lot of uh, petrol products, you know, a lot of oil products to keep the residue stuck to the plant. Oh, yes. OK. That's what so you don't want it to happen. You want to use something that will wash away. So you have to apply it a little more often. So what? But at least it protects the crop and you're not poisoning yourself. Yeah, exactly. Time. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like anything else. Mm. I mean, if you want great fruits and vegetables it takes time so you mm -hmm. you're going to have to take some extra time and um but yeah that always i i love fresh broccoli and it's like i you know i see this fresh broccoli growing and then the next day i go out there and it's just gone mm -hmm. and it's like oh my gosh so now i know what to do but one thing i did want to ask you yes i i did look on your website and it's very interesting because i know you do these talks at different libraries mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. and helping people um, that want to have their own home gardens. And I think that's so important now, not only because of, you know, with the crisis, some people have more time to spend at home and gardening is such a therapeutic thing as well as it's healthy because if you're, you are producing your own herbs and vegetables, mm -hmm. it's, it's a health, you know, it's very healthy for you. So I wanted to ask you, um, if you could give us or give my listeners some tips on just some basic tips. I mean, the one thing that the, uh, the, uh, pyrethium, is that what you call that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's definitely yeah. a good something for people to go to, but just some tips on, um, you know, now that we're home for aspiring gardeners, um, what, what, do you, what can you do to, you know, start a home garden? Like if somebody's right, never right. done that before, just some things to do, some, some maybe small steps somebody could make that has never done it before, maybe intimidated by starting. Right. Well, you start small, start with, with uh, you know, when I had, uh, when I lived there, before I had the farm, I lived in, in Nutley, New Jersey, and I had a small garden, maybe 25 by, by 20 feet. And what I did was I just went out and I bought myself some, Simple planks of uh, cheap lumber, cheap uh, number two pine, um, let's say uh, two by two by eight by eight feet, two by eight inches by eight feet. And then I, so if with three boards, you can make one box. So you make each box four by eight. Yes. So, and you screw them together, you put lay them on the ground, level them off, and, and then fill it with either break up the soil that was there. And if it's, if it's too rocky or it's too much clay in this area, we tend in, in New Jersey, there tends to be a lot of clay. So I remember what I did in Nutley was I, I put my box in, I leveled it off and I put little, little stakes to hold it. And then what I did was I would dig down about a foot and then I would take the clay out. And then I went to Home Depot or one of those garden places. And I yes. Bought I'm simple. I have a simple mix uh, for for each bag and, and for each box, where I would take um, one big uh, three cubic foot of peat moss, like eight uh -huh. bags of topsoil, a few bags of compost, one bag of cow manure, mix that all together, and then uh -huh. put 
the box. And then I would put nice soil. And then I would make a compost bin. And then in the compost bin, take all the table scraps that you can, eggshells, any, any vegetable scraps and uh, banana peels, whatever you can throw in there, keep it going, leaves, whatever, yes. you, grass clippings, mix it all together, uh-huh. make a two, two foot, three foot high little bin, and then you uh-huh. take it to the bottom, and I was constantly adding that as it would mature. To uh-huh. the, after a few years, I had a nice little, um, I didn't have to buy any more soil because I was just using my own uh, compost. And uh, the thing about doing a raised bed is it's it's inexpensive. The boards are only a few dollars a piece. Yes. Uh, five or six dollars. I mean, for twenty dollars you can get a whole setup. Um, yes. And the soil is a dollar a bag. Topsoil is not that expensive. Yes. Uh, yes. And what you do is, and the, the reason I like raised beds and they're framed in is it keeps a lot of the small pests out, like little rodents or little moles or little um, you know animals that can get in. Also, it's higher off the ground. Because a lot of people, and I have to be honest, because unfortunately a lot of young people don't like doing gardening. Yes. Uh, they're not exposed to it for whatever reason. They're just not interested. Um, yes. Even when I talk, the, 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 I, it's just a lot of old people coming in, you know, <laughs> the, the older people, I should say. And yes. But they don't bend down that much, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> So we'll do a raised bed and use some of the tools that I show you here. You, it saves your back, you know. Yes. And it, Gives you control, so you don't get a lot of erosion where things are going to run away. The soil is going to wash out. It gives you a lot of control. It contains everything. Um, yes. Well, I wound up with I put I think four or five boxes in, and what I did was I spaced the boxes out like two feet, which yeah. happens to be the width of the lawnmower, so or the width of the little tray, the little cart that I would bring in. So uh-huh. everything out. So this way, if you wanted to mow it, the mower goes down. Have grass in between. It looks really nice. Oh and yes. You know, things of that type. That's what we would yes. do. Yes, yes. And it, it really mm-hmm. is. It's so simple. So people can, mm-hmm. you know, it, um, just start just like anything else. Start with baby steps. You know, if you just, I, I think, right, if, if they just want to even grow just a couple of, you know, plants, just try it. Get, I mean, you'll oh, be sure. surprised. People are just surprised. I tell them and they're like, oh, my gosh, I just planted a seed and it actually grew. They actually think you know it's something mm-hmm. magic to get a seed to grow and it really is not as difficult it's you know not. eventually you have to spend time but as we're saying you know anything worthwhile takes a little bit of time but it's a nice hobby it's a great hobby to have there are so many benefits also um one of the things i did want to ask you too with your expertise are there any trends like in vegetables or fruits or anything that you could tell us about well, what, well, you know, it seems now with the pandemic, um, they're talking about a lot, unfortunately, a lot of the vegetables because of, uh, the, of the, the supply chain and, and uh, the way things are going there. If you've seen in the news, they're destroying a lot of them because they can't get them to market or there's. Oh, my gosh. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that. For example, in our county, we have. Um, 11, 11 uh, dairies. And, and, and in New York, raw milk is also legal. So uh-huh. a lot of people from New York City get the raw milk, which is not treated or pasteurized or anything. Yes, yes. They have to dump 9,000 gallons a day because they're not selling it. Oh, my gosh. What a waste. So, yes. Uh, so now it's more timely than ever and I, that you can to grow your own because at some point the tomatoes are going to become expensive, the peppers are going to be expensive, the eggplant. Yes. Because they're dumping a lot of this, and by the time they regrow it, you'll have yours. <laughs> so, yes. So, so uh, it's so easy, and they're easy to do. I, I recommend with tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, uh, things of that type, even zucchini. Start with the little little seedlings that you can get at a garden center at one of the home improvement centers. They're not expensive. They're easy to transplant. Um, and if you're starting your garden small you know, you don't have to get right into it and build a whole bunch of boxes. Maybe start with one box this year and say, you know what, I'm going to put in four tomato plants. I'm going to put in two peppers, two eggplant, and whatever. And you could fit that in there comfortably. And they say, you know, next year I may expand and do a second box. You know, yes. So you start, like you said, baby steps. But I think the trend is right now that pretty much, um, you know, you, you all the vegetables are going to be in demand. I mean, I saw a picture on the 
the news the other day of all the zucchini that's being dumped in Florida it was like mountains of it, you know. Oh it my like, goodness! You know, uh, and and that's such a waste. Um, it, it 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 is it is a waste. But yes, I think um, I I know. People have a lot of time at home now during the crisis, and it's so mm-hmm. important to, you know, to do something like this. It's a great family activity. Also, I know you said you don't have a lot of young people at your at your talks and things, but it's a great way to, to get kids involved in it now that they, you know, that they're home from school. And it's very, it's mm-hmm. very educational. It's a great activity for kids to do. And I always felt that kids just ha- a lot of them don't have a clue as to where their food comes from. So they don't know. They, they don't, don't. Know. Ex- exactly. So it's a great way to teach them also. But um, so one question I did want to ask you, and I always ask this to all my guests because food means so many different things to me. So I'm going to ask you, what does food mean to you? Well, you know, there's nothing like um, having fresh food, fresh vegetables and uh, available to you if you can do it. And that's where the gardening comes in, because if you taste the difference between a tomato that comes from the the supermarket as the one that you can grow yourself, it's day and night. And it's pretty much the same with a lot of the vegetables that you you can get, uh, you know, in in the store. So if you have the chance to, to, to grow your own, you will see the difference and it will make you appreciate it even more because we have a pet. My wife always, we joke, we have a pet guinea pig. And when we, sometimes my wife would buy him broccoli from the store and he wouldn't eat it. And then we gave him broccoli from the farm and he would eat that. So, <laughs> you know, that we don't know. Yes. <laughs> so, so, uh, but, uh, so, you know, and, and we have to, well, I tell this even at my talks, we all have to do the best we can. You know, we're, we're all not going to be farmers. We're all not going to be gardeners. Uh, but so, but we have to do our homework and, and it, always try to find a place where you, uh, a farm stand or, or a local farmer or a local, um, um, green grocer that you can trust where you can say, you know, did, did you know where this came from? Um, you know, I, I really need to know because I don't want to be poisoning myself at some level. Yes. Um, so, do a little bit of legwork and, and, and people can, you know, people seek us out all the time. There, there's other farmers in our area. There's other farmers here in New Jersey and there are great farms out in Pennsylvania, Brandywine Valley and all that. There's great places there um, where you can get fresh, you know, um, organic and, and naturally grown produce. So, yes, but yes. Uh, we don't have to, you know, it's the society we live in. We're trapped sometimes, in, especially in the winter. You you're at the mercy, you, you, you know, when I was a kid, we used to eat seasonal, you know, so you didn't have yes. to make in the winter. You had, you know, a lot of beans and a lot of uh, things of potatoes and things of that type, you know. Yes, yes, yes. And I, you did bring out one point that I think is really important. Throughout the U.S., there are lots of these small farms, small mm-hmm. farm stands. And right now, it's so important to really um, support the small local farmers and it's a benefit for you as well because you know who's producing the mm-hmm. products. You're getting fresh, locally produced products, and it's really, really important right now, especially, you know, whether you're going to garden yourself or not. Most of the time, people aren't going to grow everything. They're going to try and grow a little bit of something. Mm-hmm. So for anything else, it's really important to uh, promote are small local farmers, no matter where you live, anywhere throughout the country. And actually, since this show is on the Internet, actually throughout the world, really mm-hmm. promote your small local farmers. So that's Absolutely. great. Definitely. So can you uh, I want our listeners to be able to come and visit you, but also mm-hmm. to uh, find your website. Can you tell us your website? Sure. Our website is uh, www.brocofarms.com, B-R-A-C-C-O. F-A-R-M-S dot com. On Facebook, and we're also on LinkedIn. We have presence pretty much on those three uh, venues. 
Great. And I will also have a link to your website on my website where this um, episode is posted. So they'll have the link there. But just in case they want to get there sooner, that is that's the link. Well, Tony, thank you so much. And hopefully I will get to come and visit. It sounds like Pine Island and Bracco Farms sounds like such a special place. So I'm hoping. It is a special place. Yes, it does. And I'm hoping, definitely hoping I get to visit one of these days. I hope you do, too. So we'd love to have you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for visiting. And uh, I'm sure we'll be coming back to you for, for some other updates and, and more information. Absolutely. on Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks for joining us and listening to the Maria Liberati Show. Thanks to my producer, Britton Roselle. Go to my website, marialiberati.com, to keep up with my blog and the show and my book series. Send us your answer to the question, what does food mean to you in a recorded soundbite no longer than 60 seconds? If your soundbite is selected to be part of one of the upcoming segments, you will receive a copy of my book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. I'd love to hear from my listeners and have you be part of my show. If you have any questions or ideas for upcoming segments, email me directly at maria at marialiberati.com. Peace, love, and pasta. Till next time.